Good evening and Merry Christmas. Christmas. Welcome to Valmont Community Presbyterian Church on this Christmas Eve and also Advent 4. So it is such a pleasure to have you joining us today for this time of worship. Hopefully you were able to grab both a bulletin and a candle on your way in. At the conclusion of the service, as we are sharing the light of Christ with one another, I will invite us all to have our candles lit, and uh, during which time we will sing both Silent Night and Joy to the World. However, there is always a note on candle safety uh, that, that's important. Uh, if there is a lit candle, uh, the unlit candle will always be tilted into the lit candle, not the other way around, or you will pour hot wax on yourself and your neighbor. So please uh, be sure that you, uh, you utilize them in a responsible manner. <laughs> um, but this is always such a wonderful service where uh, this is not like Good Friday. This is not well choreographed. People will be standing up and walking around and coming forward. And that is such an important part of our church with the community right there in the name. Uh, this is a church that exists because we come together and we engage in worship with one another. So if you're visiting with us tonight, um, I hope that you will feel free to stand up, walk around, do what you need to do, because this is, yes, a worshipful space, but this is a space where you specifically are invited to worship. So whatever it is that you need to do tonight in order to share in this joyous evening, I hope that you can be free to do that. With that being said, I would like to invite up Doug and Karen Myers to lead us in this evening's call to worship. The poet Anne Weems wrote, What I really like to give you for Christmas is a star, brilliance in a package, something you could keep in your pocket of your jeans or in the pocket of your being. We've come tonight for the light, for the shining candles and the smiles of young faces and the brilliance of tears on a neighbor's cheek. But remember the words of the psalmist. Give to the Lord, all families of all nations. 
Give to the Lord glory and power. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring gifts, enter his courtyards. Bow down to the Lord in his holy splendor. Tremble before him, all the earth. On this Christmas Eve, we tremble at the wonder we remember together. God entered our world in the body of a poor child, born on a dark night in a chilly stable, with only a manger for his bed. God entered the world and took on human form to show us how to live in hope, peace, joy, and love. When we light the Christ candle, we remember the star above the stable. We celebrate the light coming into the darkness. And everyone, glory to God in the highest. We give thanks for the brilliance of the stars. We give thanks for the birth of Jesus Christ, God with us. We'll give choir just a moment to assemble. First lesson. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness will sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Thank you. 
Our second lesson tonight is Isaiah 35, verses 1 and 2, and then 5 through 10. The return of the Lord's redeemed. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Then <clears throat> will the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. So I'll read you from Jeremiah for our third lesson. 
The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I have fulfilled the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a, a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteous savior. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night no longer come at that appointed time. Then my covenant with David, my servant, and my covenant with the Levites, who are priests ministering before me, can be broken, and David will no longer have a descendant to the reign of his throne.
The fourth lesson tonight is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will, be, he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The angel visits Mary, Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. 
The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Our next lesson comes to us from Luke 2, 1 through 14. 
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who he was pledged to marry and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there, was a sh and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace, peace to those whom his favor rests. The seventh lesson, the good news announced, Luke 2, verses 15 through 20. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, 
they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as he had been told. <gasps> on my eyes. Let me see. Oh yeah, there we go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that had been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those 
who believed. In his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh! 
I was so moved by Patrick's reading that I got up early, so I'm sorry, Jack, but <laughs> goodness, thank you for that. Um, throughout my childhood, my parents had a, an admittedly noble goal of trying to instill meaningful practices into our celebrations of Advent and of Christmas. Some years we would bring Swedish cardamom bread and coffee to day laborers who were looking for work outside of Home Depot. Wow. Or we'd have devotionals around the dinner table or we might sing carols around lighted Advent candles as my father played guitar. Many of these practices would wax and wane, not necessarily being practiced each and every year. But one practice did, however, appear most years, and that was our symbolic box of memories. We had the little caps that my sister and I received in the hospital where we were born, we had the collar of Skippy, our beloved first dog. A plastic egg that was filled with windshield glass from an unfortunate accident that was caused by my younger sister, <laughs> not by me. <laughs> there was also a plastic toy horse that we kept to remind us of when my father was riding one without any right to, and he was bucked off and broke his ribs. There were quite a few other reminders that lived in this shoebox throughout the year, only to be paraded out in Advent so that we could recite and retell the family history to one another. And yet, there was some discontent fomenting in the ranks about this annual remembrance, particularly between my sisters and myself, who found the whole exercise a tad depressing. We thought of ourselves as a relatively happy family and a healthy group, but our family's story appeared to have quite a few painful hinges that made up the foundational events of our life together. We wanted this Advent tradition to be joyous, but my parents seemed to want to make us cry. <laughs> and this makes me think about Advent and Christmas as a whole. The stories that we tell over and over again about how God comes to us as a normal and dependent baby. We like the nice and picturesque images of Joseph kneeling by Mary, who is more put together than any woman delivering a child in a stable should be. We like the respectful animals who almost genuflect. <laughs> you like the respectful animals? All right. Before this coming king, we brush over how many unwelcome, smelly shepherds invade the space of this delivery room. We want visible angels adoring nearby while misplaced magi offer a visible contrast to the humble state of the other guests. Essentially, we want to dress up the story in such a way where it doesn't disrupt Andrea Bocelli singing Ave Maria on the hi-fi. But the Advent and Christmas stories are really more like my family's memory box than we might prefer. Prophecies about the Messiah are spoken out of a recognition of need. The fact that we can't address the warfare, the injustice, the poverty or brokenness of humanity or of ourselves we can't do this on our own. 
the reputations and lives of Jesus' parents are put at risk by this wild plan that has been concocted by our God to come and to be present with us. Jesus is born to the unhoused, who are uprooted by political greed. Jesus comes to us because we live in darkness and because God knows that the darkness cannot overcome him. We need some of the sad and depressing elements of the Advent story for the joy of Christmas to genuinely make sense. My family would eventually lose our first dog, no matter what. But I am glad that we remember how he blessed us, chasing away the little white butterflies from our garden. <laughs> the broken windshield was frightening, but it did bring the family closer together. My father's broken ribs were painful, but it resulted in several weeks where we kids were given the rare opportunity of taking care of him instead of him taking care of us. The pain of the Advent story makes God's comfort all the more real because we know the sorrow that this comfort has addressed. Christmas is powerful precisely because it is honest. It changes us because there is something that legitimately needs to be changed. So I hope that you will allow for yourself to encounter Jesus' incredible power this Christmas tide. May you accept the difficult parts of the story so that you can also experience the joyous changes that Jesus brings. May you have a Merry Christmas precisely because Jesus has taken what is sorrowful and has made it merry for you. Thanks be to God. Merry Christmas. Amen. Holy and gracious Lord, we thank you for the incredible gift of your Son, our Savior, in our midst. We ask God that we would be a people who are changed because we need you to change us. We thank you, God, for the incredible mercy and grace that you show us each and every day. May we encounter it in a rich and powerful way in this Christmas tide. In the name of Jesus Christ, the coming Lord, we pray. Amen. And because we share in this joy of light that is overcoming the darkness, we are given the opportunity to reflect upon that in powerful ways. Not only in thought, or in action, but sometimes in symbol, becomes a really important way for us to internalize the truths of Christmas. And so as we are about to join with one another in song, we will also join with one another in sharing the light of Christ. Doug and Karen have lit for us the Christ candle the light that we recognize as beginning life, not only for all of us, but for all things. And so I will light my candle from the center candle here in the Advent wreath, and then we will share it with one another, again, with the unlit candle dipping into the lit one. And as we do this, we will sing Silent Night. And at the end of the song, I will ask for us to pause for a moment and to reflect on the light that Christ has shared in our midst.
This is the light not only to fill a sanctuary, but to fill all of the world. I would invite for you to join me in singing the first verse of Silent Night a cappella. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.